Okay. Um, so there you go. You can see my whole face now. Um, I just wanted to say hi to everyone. Um, I wanted to let you know where I am. Um, I am on Bowen Island, which is a small island um, off of Vancouver. Um, so I am in, some people call it the Sunshine Coast, some people call it the Northern Gulf Islands, um, so Southern BC. Um, and I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm part of the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Um, and I am the outreach coordinator for the program. So that means that I talk to lots of different groups of people and I talk to them about cleanups and leading cleanups with our program. Um, and I introduce them to the idea of what a cleanup is and what it means. Um, and uh, it's one of my favorite things to do, talk to people about what it means to join our program and what it means to be a participant with us. Um, so, um, I just wanted to say quickly before we kind of dive into things um, that uh, all upcoming cleanups uh, need to be canceled or postponed due to uh, COVID-19. At this time, um, it's, we can't guarantee the safety of our participants and we can't guarantee the safety of our volunteers and um, it's just not possible for us to lead cleanups right now. And we're really sorry about that, but we'll keep everybody updated as to when it is possible to lead cleanups again, because we are really excited for that. Um, but today I'm gonna talk about youth, about kids, about you guys, about what it means for you to be a part of our program and what it means for you to be a citizen scientist and what that word even is. But first, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna start and talk about the two ways that our program normally works. So normally, um, you can either lead a cleanup. So that means that you go and you get a couple of your friends or your siblings or a teacher or anyone you want or even just yourself and you head down to your local shoreline and your shoreline can actually be anywhere so your shoreline doesn't necessarily need to be on a beach it could be a backyard it could be a school because everywhere is actually part of our whole watershed and all our oceans rivers all of our um, different biomes are connected so it doesn't need to be at a specific beach, something that looks like what you think of when you hear shoreline. So normally you can either lead a cleanup or you can join someone else's cleanup. Um, and we've got maps on our website where you log in and you go and you look around, you pan around, you drag the map around and you see what cleanups are happening where and the different ways um, that you can join them either as a participant or a leader. Um, but, uh, what we're talking about today is citizen scientists. So what is a citizen scientist? Who is a citizen scientist? And what that word even means? So we're going to start with what it means. So citizen is anyone, literally anyone. Um, and sometimes people use the word community instead of citizen. And community sometimes um, makes more sense depending on what you're talking about. Um, so a community scientist, um, might be someone who's participating in a project, um, like a local project near your house, something like that. Um, and it means the same thing as it is in here. Um, so, uh, and then scientist. And a scientist is someone who does research, who collects data. That's also a super broad term. Um, so put them together and it's an everyday person. So anyone who collects data, who does research. So. Um, when you're talking about shoreline cleanup, anyone is a citizen scientist, anyone who participates. So you don't have to have any special education, specific training. You don't have to go to have graduated high school. You don't have to have even finished elementary school to be a citizen scientist. It can be literally anyone. Um, and kids are one of the most important groups of citizen scientists for shoreline cleanup. Um, kids and youth so like anyone between the age of 
five to 25. That is the group of people who collects the most data for uh, shoreline cleanup. And when I say data, I'm referring to the information that someone collects when they go out and do a cleanup. So you, you lead or you join your cleanup, you head down to your shoreline, wherever it is, and you take with you a data card, which is a piece of paper, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, um, and you write down every single thing you find. So you're like, okay, I found three water bottles. Let me write that down. I found uh, a can. Let me write that down. Um, and that information is citizen scientist information. Um, so by collecting that data, you are a citizen scientist. And kids, like I said, are the most important group. So they do the most cleanups out of anyone. Um, we have lots of people who do them with their office or their workplace, like your parents or anybody. Um, but uh, kids do way more. So this is the litter data card and you can kind of, all of the items on there are pretty um, basic. They're items that you know, that you already see. Um, they're not confusing items. You don't need to study this to learn how to use it. All you do is you take this with you and you do a little check for every item you find. And um, you just, you put it on a clipboard. Um, just by using that, you become a citizen scientist. So, um, like I said, citizen scientists, they find a lot of stuff that you already know about. Um, they don't find anything that is uh, like super complex. They're not doing, they're not taking samples of soil or they're not, they're not digging. They're just picking stuff up right off the ground. Um, and this is what that stuff looks like. So this is um, what we sometimes call a flat lay of, um, the findings from one specific cleanup. So this stuff includes rep butts, bottle caps, hair ties, lighters, and then some building materials, pieces of plastic. So this is stuff that's found everywhere in the world um, and that you might find in your kitchen trash can, but that people have left outside. Um, so we call that recreational litter. So when people are doing a recreation, like when they're recreating outside, they're hanging out with their friends, they're sitting having a coffee, they leave these things behind. This is another picture. So this stuff, you see a, a couple of different items. You see a fishing rod, um, some kids' toys, parts of shoes. So the people who collected this stuff, they were citizen scientists and they were kids. Um, and this information, is super, super important to us. Um, this girl's also a citizen scientist. So this type of information we use, um, we compile it, we count it all up, we um, submit it. So you take all your data on your data card and you give it to us, and then we give it to other groups around the world who are curious about um, the litter that we find in Canada specifically. So they're specifically wondering, so they're like, okay, so um, in Toronto, how many um, cigarette butts did you guys find in 2015? And we look in our data and we look up and we find that number. Or in Iqaluit, um, how many uh, lost pairs of shoes did you find? And then people will give us uh, their requests for information and we give them the data. Um, uh, another thing that we often find a lot of is building materials um, uh, and construction materials. So generally stuff that shouldn't be on the shoreline. That's not recreational litter. So it's not something that somebody left there um, after hanging out. This is something that might have washed away from a big construction site or um, was part of a dump. Um, so that sort of thing. So not just recreational litter. Um, and these things are a little bit harder to pick up. Um, they can be often be bigger, more cumbersome, and sometimes they'll have been embedded into uh, the environment and they're a little bit difficult to remove. Um, so that's, uh, removing that stuff is also citizen science, um, but it's just a tiny bit more difficult. Um, 
So I want to talk about some of the like the really big accomplishments that our citizen scientists um, who are youth have um, accomplished. So um, since our program has been around, uh, citizen scientists have walked along more than 44,000 kilometers of Canadian shoreline. So they went out there with their friends, with their teachers, with their parents and families, and they collected litter data from 44,000 kilometers of shoreline. And like I said, that could be a beach or that could be any type of watershed or even their backyard. So sometimes people will go around their backyard or around their house or down their street. And that counts as kilometers of shoreline. So one of the things that you probably heard about a lot is tiny plastic and foam pieces. Um, so these are, uh, this is a photo of little pieces of foam and microplastics and then some larger plastics. And citizen scientists with shoreline cleanup have collected more than a million pieces of tiny plastic and foam. And um, once we're able to do cleanups again, hopefully more of you are able to collect more of these things. Um, because we only even started collecting this type of stuff a couple of years ago. Our program's been around for a really long time, but we didn't think very much about the small pieces. We didn't know about them until a couple of years ago. So we've collected a million tiny plastic and foam pieces, but that's only since 2016, whereas a lot of the other stuff we started collecting data on in the 90s. So there's a lot of potential. And then this is one of my favorites. Um, since the 90s, we've collected five and a half million cigarette butts from around Canada. So that is an easy one. We sometimes call that low hanging fruit. That's one where you can just go a lot of the time in parks or a common place where people hang out outside. You will see just piles of cigarette butts underneath benches or out anywhere. Um, and they're made of something called cellulose acetate, which is not paper, even though they look like paper. Um, and we collect them because they are on their way to turning into stuff that looks like this. Um, and we need to prevent that. They're not very big, but they're still a lot bigger than teeny tiny pieces. Um, so we have collected more and probably um, a lot more than this five and a half million, but that's what we've been able to count. Um, and every year, we come up with the top 12 most common items found on Canadian shorelines. So that is um, called our dirty dozen. And we haven't been able, it takes us a long time to count up all this stuff. So we haven't finished counting the data from 2019. We're almost done. Um, but this is from 2018. So even in one year, we collected 560,000 cigarette butts. And then you can see all the other numbers here. Um, uh, the other most common things are, like I said, the tiny plastic and foam food wrappers, and that's usually like candy wrappers or chip bags, and then bottle caps. Um, one thing to always remember is you always want to screw your bottle cap back on your bottle before you put it in the recycling so the bottle um, doesn't get lost, the bottle cap doesn't get lost. Uh, and then paper, and that's anything made out of paper, plastic bags, beverage cans, so that's like beer cans or pop cans, and then plastic bottles. Um, so that's sort of like um, water bottles, but can be any, any other kind of pop bottle or drink bottle as well, and then straws, and then other packaging. So like thing that if you go pick up food at the store, that might be um, like a plastic container that your food came in, and then foam. Foam is often from boats and fishing, um, and then coffee cups. So those are the top 12 most common items from 2018. And sometimes those items change, um, and sometimes be different things each year. But usually those items are pretty similar, except um, coffee cups had never been on this list until 2018, which was pretty surprising to us. We thought that coffee cups would be really common um, in all the years before 2018, but they weren't. They only started to become a little bit more common um, in the last two years. Um, so when we collect all this information, we, like I said, we provide it to other people. 
So um, we contribute to international databases. So there's a group called the Ocean Conservancy, which collects litter data from all around the world. Um, and they uh, contribute that to different research efforts, um, different cities or municipalities. So a municipality is like a city or a town, the government of that town um, will ask for our litter data. Um, and then you can also use that information to make changes in your own life. So you see different pieces of litter right around your house. You go, okay, well, maybe um, I'm contributing to this problem in certain ways. So here's how I change. Um, and it's really helpful to talk to your school or your family about the things that you find during your cleanup. Um, and then my favorite part, uh, and then I think we might have some questions about this, is the unusual items. So every now and then, um, we find some weird stuff during cleanup. Sure, we find all the regular trash um, that you already know about, but sometimes we'll find some pretty crazy stuff. Um, so we found skidoos, a polar bear skin, hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes, and coconuts, and coconuts, um, so many coconuts everywhere all the time, which is so weird because that doesn't make any sense. We're in Canada, there's nowhere, why? Um, and then we found a box of worms once and a purple rain cassette. And nobody's used cassettes since the 90s. Um, uh, somebody lost their Invisalign braces. And then we found things like stuffed animals and um, plastic toys, all sorts of things. Um, so we also keep track of these because these are interesting and they're kind of cool to see. Um, like, so you find all your regular items, but what else do you find? anything weird, anything odd, anything out of the ordinary, because we want to keep track of that as well. Um, so right now, we can't do cleanups. And we're really bummed about that, but it's for the best. Um, we need to make sure that our volunteers are as safe as possible. So one of the things you can do um, that is also considered citizen science is you can lead a waste audit at home. So um, in about a week, um, I can send all of you uh, the information on how to do that. We're coming up with a really simple, clear guide on exactly what you need to do. And you'll send that data to us um, and you'll become a citizen scientist that way because right now um, cleanups are not possible. Um, so this is just a little bit of a taste of practicing citizen science data until you can learn how to uh, do a shoreline cleanup on your own. So that's about all I have for now, but I'm, I'd am i take any questions um, or chat with anybody um, uh, and talk about anything that you guys are interested in. So if you have a question um, for Julia, can you, you can type them in the chat or maybe some ideas about what you can do for you know, literally just around your house to participate in um, the citizen science project. And I would like to know where you get those forms. Yeah, the forms are from our website. Um, and I can send everybody a link to that afterward. Um, and we also provide so many other things. So once it's time and once we're able to do cleanups, um, we have all sorts of resources. We'll help you find materials, we'll help you call your municipality, we'll even help you find a place to do a cleanup if you're like, wow, everything near my house is super clean. Um, and sometimes that is the case where people will go to the beach and they'll be like, um, excuse me, my, everything is really clean. I don't need to do a cleanup. So we'll help them find a place that is dirty. And yeah, you can definitely, like I said, you can definitely lead a cleanup that's not at a beach. We want people to lead cleanups everywhere. Um, it can be, uh, like I said, like grassy trail in the, um, street outside your house, but be extra careful. Um, but one of our other favorite places to leave cleanups is storm drains because storm drains, um, go directly to ocean. Um, and if you don't have a storm drain near your house, um, often just along the edges of, um, your sidewalks or your streets or your or, or trails, you will find the stuff that would be in a storm drain. Like where I live, there's no storm drains because um, it's pretty remote. Um, so I just go the little paths where people walk all the time. That's a really good place to do a cleanup. So um, let me see, where was that question? 
Madeline would like to know if you have, have ever found dog collars or leashes during oh. this airline cleanup. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have. Um, we will find stuff like that a lot, actually. Um, so like pet, pet toys, uh, that stuff we try to return to the city or to if we have it because like sometimes a dog collar will have a phone number on it. We'll call the phone number and say, hey, we found this. Um, that stuff's super helpful because um, a lot of things we find we know belong to somebody. Um, like even like a ski do or shoes, we're like, we know this belongs to somebody, but it's not like a dog collar where it has the name written on it. Um, it looks like Carrie is wondering if we've ever found a dead animal. Yes, we have found many, many, many different animals. Um, and that's always a little bit difficult because you need to know um, what to do when you're near that animal. And most of the time, the answer is nothing. You just don't touch it, you leave it there. And if you are in a place um, where you know who to call, you can call animal control and say, hey, I found a thing like maybe it's a seal or um, an otter or even something smaller like a squirrel or a bird. Um, and they can come and deal with it in the appropriate way. Um, sometimes if we see an animal that's struggling, we will call, um, we're a part of the Vancouver Aquarium, so we will call our marine mammal rescue team. And they will come and get it depending on um, if it's healthy enough or they'll leave it there depending if they think it's gonna be okay. Um, but we do see lots of animals pretty frequently. Okay, um, it, are, does anyone else have any other questions? Or maybe we can put in the chat, um, where do you think that you can do an effective cleanup at this point, at this time? Where will looks you? Like, oh, it looks like someone's asking if we, if it's safe to do a cleanup under a highway. And it really depends on um, that specific area. So, um, so it looks like Leah asked that. Um, you know best, but if you have a question about a specific area, you can always um, give me a call, give my team a call, and we'll look it up and we'll see, like, does that is that a safe area? We'll check it out for you um, because sometimes it is safe and sometimes it's not. Um, but that is often, like, underpasses will be areas where there's a lot of litter. Looks like Carrie's also wondering if we've ever found any bones. Yes, we find bones all the time. So same thing um, with animals. I found even um, last week, I uh, I was just going for a walk and I ended up picking up some trash and then I saw some bones and I think they were probably like a squirrel or a bird, something really light. But yeah, we see bones all the time. Oh, it's looks like um someone is suggesting that a wildlife reserve is a really good place to do a cleanup uh, yeah totally that's a really good place um if you have access to one that's an awesome place to do a cleanup um there's not one near my house but i would love to do a cleanup on a wildlife reserve be awesome. and madeline would like to know this is a really good really really good question what do you do with if you find um needles or something that's not legal yeah, so that's a great question. It depends where you are. Um, so depending on what city or area of um, BC or the country that you're in, um, but we can help you with that. Um, so before your cleanup, um, when you register on our website, there's actually specific information about how to dispose of needles in the area that you're already in the area where you live. Um, so we already have that information for most of the country. Um, and sometimes the information is different for each different area. So I can't just, I can't answer that specifically, but normally, uh, normally the answer is don't touch it, leave it there. And then you will call a number and say, Hey, I found a needle in this place and someone else will come and pick it up. Um, if you are trained, 
in picking up what's called sharps. Um, me and my team are all trained in picking those things up. So we carry with us a needle safety bin and then we pick them up when we're at cleanups. Um, but that's a really good question. Have you ever found a lost pet while you are doing a shoreline cleanup? Oh, I have not, but other people have. Yeah, people have found, um, there is a story of someone who found uh, a dog when they were doing a cleanup on a trail in Ontario, and then they were able to return it to its owner, which was really happy. Okay, so Madeline says, thanks for the great answer. Yeah, of course, Madeline. Okay, so I think Julia, that's it for the questions. Can you put your website back up again, please? So that we can yes. all know where we're going and I'll ensure that we put that on our resource page as well. So when the students go to connectednorth.org um, at home, they can uh, look under OceanWise and find the cleanup. Okay, so, so yes. students, if you wanna get a pencil, and paper and maybe write down one of those websites or the Facebook pages or Instagram. Um, yeah, you can message, sorry, you can message any of the, the Facebook or the Instagram too, and we'll reply just as quick as if you go to our website or anything. And if anyone is interested in doing a waste audit, um, which means that you look through your trash and you see, you kind of like check out what's in your trash and you see if anything could be used in a different way. Um, we're gonna be leading a bunch of activities on doing that in the next couple of days. So that sounds great because we know that Nicole from OceanWise has been talking a lot about citizen science. So this is a way that the students can get involved at home and um, also be participating and um, creating a bigger impact on the planet by doing some simple just clean up around their house and this and you know carefully near um, sh um, drains near their home and it's a really good time of year to be helping with those kind of um, initiatives because the snow is melting and leaving a lot of things um, uncovered so I just want to thank Julia from Shoreline Cleanup and the students for coming today. Um, and remember students, we still have a few more sessions. If you'd like to join us at, at connectednorth.org at home, um, and we'd love to see you there for some storytelling and um, some movement. So we'll see you guys later. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Please feel free to send me a message if you have any questions.